right, this is Coach MJ on the Real Mission I'm Possible show. Today, we're going to be talking to someone who could restock the library of most countries. His name is John Murphy, and John has written over 20 books and continues to work on new literary projects. He's a management consultant. He has shared the stage with people like Deepak Chopra, one of my mentors, Zig Ziegler, and others, including Storm and Norman, uh, General Schwarzkopf. So he's done it all. He's been there. And companies around the world have turned to him for advice and leadership. And lately, uh, he's taken a different turn, a turn that I am very attracted to because it taps into our true possibilities in all of us. And I'm going to just welcome John to the show. John, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Coach. Love being here. Very yeah. grateful. So we're going to just get into it. We had a little pre-show discussion, and I was just admiring some of the things I'd found out that uh, Mr. John has accomplished in his life. Um, and I explained to him also, for those of you who are tuned into the show regularly, you under, you know that we talk about adversity, we talk about thought leadership, and he's got both of those cornered and some new tricks as well. John, could you just give us an idea how you got started in all this? 20 books, all these Fortune 500 companies, even the CIA has turned to you for success secrets. Of course they would. They're into secrets anyway. How did you get started? Well, that's a great question, Coach. I uh, I didn't plan this. Let's just start with that. I, I, I was fortunate enough to have a, an English teacher for a mother, so I did learn to write early on through a lot of pain because I'd, I'd be ready to turn in a paper and my mother would say, you're not turning that in like that. So I was I grew up with with an editor, so to speak, but I never imagined I'd be writing for, you know, for a living um, and certainly not writing books. And uh, I'm writing a lot of articles as well. I, I went into business school and I, I, I went into business in, in, in Chicago for a couple of years and I quickly discovered, wow, th this company, and it was a very large, successful company, but a lot of dysfunction, you know. I, I found that there wasn't much teamwork. And having been a competitive athlete growing up, I was surprised by that. And after a couple of years, and that was in finance, I was in their corporate finance group, which was my degree. I also discovered I didn't like finance. So I was thinking to myself, wow, I really screwed up. I, I majored in the wrong thing. This is boring. I don't like this. I took a job back in my hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan in employee relations. I wanted to get into more people stuff. So I, I took a big step backwards to in income as well as in, you know, uh, position and quickly found the same thing. Not a lot of teamwork here. In fact, it was a union environment and there was just all kinds of strife between management and the labor union, actually more than one union. And I was right in the middle of all that, trying to pull together a team uh, which I did. I mean, I, I learned hundreds and hundreds of people's names and I spent time on uh, all three shifts. I'm walking around the factories at, uh, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning because I thought my job was to relate to people, employee relations, you know, and uh, the union didn't like that. And they didn't like the fact that I was uh, trustworthy. And uh, so long story short, uh, the union fell apart. And next thing you know, I've got Harvard Business School calling me and saying, would you come tell us what in the world you did? Because it made the national newspaper actually back in 19, I think it was 86. And all of this is somewhat spontaneous. Um, like I said, I didn't really plan it. A couple of years later, the company was sold to a, a big French conglomerate. And after a short period, I was let go. Um, I, I, I was fired. So now uh, with my my wife at the time pregnant with our second child and not a whole lot of savings in the bank, I'm unemployed trying to figure out what to do. And I'm essentially called to teach and to teach team building and teach what I had learned and coach and help organizations pull together, so to speak. And that was the title actually of my first book. So I, I created a, a workshop. I wasn't able to get any real business knocking on doors. So I thought, how do I get companies to come to me? So I created uh, a workshop, rented space at a local university, 
And I think I got maybe a half a dozen people there. <laughs> and uh, but one of them was the plant manager for another company that later on went on to be uh, one of the Michigan manufacturers of the year, like two or three years in a row. And he said, uh, wow, this is great stuff. Would you come on site and, and teach our leadership team basically what you just taught me? I said, yeah, that'd be great. So now all of a sudden I'm shifting from a public workshop, which was expensive and really a loss to me financially, cost more to do it than, than I, I, I brought in. But now I've got my first real client. In fact, uh, another person attending there was, the, was in uh, human resources for one of the local banks and I got hired by the bank. And then they said, do you need any money? <laughs> I go, yeah, I, I do. So it was just uh, the story continues. So I'm now I'm now I'm an, a, a business consultant. I've got a couple of clients. I, I start offering more workshops. The workshops went from Washington to Los Angeles to Boston to New York to Miami. I, I started doing them all over the country, and from those workshops, I was getting clients, and then I was also getting inquiries. People were saying, "Well, we can't come to your workshop, but can we buy your book?" There wasn't one. I had a workbook that I had written to go with the workshop, and it was called Pulling Together the Power of Teamwork, but no book book. So I had to write a book. Uh, so my one of my sisters uh, gave me a book on how to write a book, how to get happily published by Judith Applebaum. This is back in the 80s. Anyway, and a lot's changed now, of course, with, you know, uh, Amazon publishing and, you know, ebooks and all that stuff. But back in those days, you you write a book, you, you know, you got to print off copies and bind them and it's all physical material, you know. Anyway, uh, I did everything wrong with that first book because I then went to a conference. Uh, it was actually in Orlando, a publisher's conference and had my book critiqued. By this time, I'd written a second book and the cri the critics, you know, the, the, the professionals, uh, could explain everything except one thing. And that is, how did the book sell out so fast? But besides that, the cover was wrong. There was no barcode on it. The, the, the typeset was off. It was just not, <laughs> it was not pretty, but it sold out. And then, uh, and that's, that first book, by the way, has been picked up by multiple major publishers and published in several different formats and, um, you know, sold hundreds of thousands of, of copies. So I didn't screw it up too bad. But one of the things, I, I'll, and then I'll pause after this part of the story because I think it's kind of fun. I had written that book, and in, in the book, I'd told a lot of stories and, and gave examples. And my older brother, who's now a professor at Notre Dame, he, he read the manuscript, and he said, John, you know what you need to do? You need to write an allegory. And I'm like, okay, uh, what's an allegory? I had no idea. He said, no, it's like, you know, it's like a story. It reads like a novel. And uh, Ken Blanchard, the one minute manager, things like that. And Ken's uh, endorsed uh, my work. But uh, it's a story intended to teach. So I'm like, wow, that sounds really cool. My brother gave me a, a, an example of an allegory, a book called The Goal, uh, the Goal by Goldratt. And uh, I said, wow, this is really cool. But it also tapped into my, my creative uh, genius, if you want to call it that, it, uh, my creative powers. I really had to get into the minds and hearts and souls, so to speak, of the characters to teach, to tell this story. So I wrote a book called Agent of Change, Leading a Cultural Revolution. And this was about a, a general manager for a company called TIPCO, which stands for Typical Company, trying to pull his team together and, 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 and harmonize and, and, and grow the business uh, with some with some unity. And uh, But he's getting all kinds of resistance, in, in, in particular from his plant manager who is a personal friend. And uh, anyway, Agent of Change, that was endorsed by Ken Blanchard, uh, Rich DeVos, co-founder of Amway, uh, Peter Secchia, ambassador of Italy. So, you know, a couple of generals in the military. That book really got a lot of positive uh, feedback and press. And it was my first story. So one of my friends, uh, university professor, read the book and she said to me, John, you know, you got to write the sequel. I go, I do. She goes, yeah, this is set up beautifully for the plant manager who ends up getting fired because he's just obnoxious and in the way. And he, so the 
the main character had to make a choice. Do I actually lead a culture change authentically by removing this obstacle? Or do I just let my friendship screw up the whole culture? You know, is that kind of a decision? Anyway, he he had to he had to let this guy go. And uh, so my third book, Reinvent Yourself, was the story, another allegory written by the guy that just got fired and was upset and angry and thought he was betrayed. But he was just he had all kinds of personal problems deep, deeper down. Uh, he, he he wasn't speaking to one of his sons. He, he was in a, a stressful relationship with his wife. His health wasn't good, things like that. So the reinvent yourself, and that made it in the, the national newspapers by a syndicated uh, columnist, uh, Dale Doughton. And so one thing, Coach, just led to another. Like I said at the beginning, I didn't plan all this stuff out in some articulate business plan. What I did was listen to people and 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 get get constructive feedback and act on it do something with it you know it can sting a little bit when somebody gives you feedback but if it's if it's with positive intent and usually it is you got to get through the you know ouch and take advantage of it uh, one quick example of that i gave one of my first public seminars Without being a professional speaker, trainer, any of that, and uh, a, a university uh, professor who attended uh, came up to me afterwards and said, "And I said, give me some feedback." And she said to me, "John, do you want the truth?" <laughs> you know, Coach, when you get that response, you know it's probably going to sting a little bit. It's coming. Yeah. And she gave me some very good constructive feedback. In fact, she recommended I go to a two-day course on uh, train the trainer, Bob Pike back in the day, and and uh, and I it was in Minneapolis. So I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going? I can't afford that. But I figured out a way to uh, attend, pay for it, pay for the travel, and I walked away with all kinds of great ideas and insights, things I could then incorporate into my workshops to just make them that much better. A lot of experiential learning. And I've since designed simulations that have been licensed and used by the you know, all kinds of major corporations and, and, and government. So, uh, you know, that's that's the beginning of my story anyway. And uh, it's just one thing le led to another, but a lot of uh, challenges, a lot of setbacks. You know, it's not easy losing your job when you're expecting a child and you don't have any money. <laughs> And it, it, instead of going and getting a safe job, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a shingle out. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, that had to be just a little bit of pressure, but you'd already grown accustomed to pressure. It wasn't your your first run in with adversity. Um, you had a particular incident that I read about, know about that when you were younger, um, that kind of took you out of the game. And in fact, you were told that you'd never be an athlete. Yeah. Tell it, us about that. It literally took me out of the game because I was, uh, I was very entrepreneurial as a kid growing up. I, I, I was starting businesses by, you know, by the age of uh, 10, you know, weeding gardens and gardening for people up and down the street, shoveling snow, mowing lawns, just give, give me an asset, give me a lawnmower or a shovel and I'll go out and make some money. I helped my my father paid for my older brother's first semester of college. I helped my older sister buy her first car. So I was always just like this squirrel, squirreling away money. Well, one of the businesses I started with a friend of mine was, was a landscaping lawn care company in high school. And we had, yeah, we had like 45 uh, customers and uh, a truck and a trailer and, you know, a tractor and Little by little, we we added it and we started to hire out some people. I mean, we're, we're 16, 17 years old. But one day, um, early in the morning, this customer had said, I've got some real tall grass in the backyard, like a field. Can you guys cut some of that back? Uh, so, uh, because I'm going to have a lawn party and I just, I could use more space. I said, sure, no problem. I'll take care of that for you. I was wrong. <laughs> Turns out it was a problem because I, tripped over a rock and pulled the mower up over my foot and pretty much shredded my right foot. Hmm. And, uh, you know, getting rushed to the hospital and, 
you know, a week later, I'm still in the hospital and the surgeon, I, the surgeon talks to me. He's done surgery now on my foot twice, trying to reconstruct everything. And he said, basically, your football days are over. And football was my real passion at that time, my, my dream. And uh, we had just won the state championship in Michigan the year before playing in the Pontiac Silverdome, which was really exciting for a 16, 16, 17 year old kid. And I was the, uh, you know, cap elected captain of the team, one of the three tri captain. And uh, boy, I was looking for scholarship opportunities and all that stuff, dreams of maybe the NFL one day. I'm in the hospital, literally weeping and crying that I, I screwed up so bad. How could I have done this? And um, I'll tell you what, though, long story short, two years later, I was uh, tapping that play like a champion today sign at Notre Dame completely. By the way, I was in the hospital and my grandfather, my mother's father sent me a book called On Courage, written by Frank Gifford. And one of the stories featured was Rocky Blyer. Rocky was uh, a Notre Dame grad, went on to play for the Pittsburgh Steelers and won four Super Bowls as a starting tailback. Rocky was also in Vietnam and was severely injured and was told by doctors he had shrapnel in his, his leg and his right foot blown apart. I think it was his right foot, same as mine, uh, blown apart with uh, uh, grenade and uh, shrapnel and whatnot and gunfire in his hamstring. He had a lot of, you know, and, and he got told uh, after multiple surgeries, your, your football days are over. So I'm reading this book and reading this story in the hospital about how Rocky overcame all of that, ended up making the Steelers and going on to win four Super Bowls. I'm like, wow, how cool is that? I, I'm going to do that, you know, so I had some go. inspiration. Yeah, just a simple book that my grandfather gave me and a, and a very powerful story really changed things up. So it was especially uh, fun for me. Years later, Rocky Blyer was on a speaking circuit with uh, the Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn, and, and I was uh, a part of that. And so I'm uh, I, How I got cool to meet. is that? Yeah, so I got to meet Rocky. I'd never met him before. And uh, I, I gave him a copy of Reinvent Yourself. That's what I was speaking on at that time, which he, he gave me a beautiful endorsement for Reinvent Yourself. But he actually let me hold all four of his Super Bowl rings in my hand. And uh, that was just a, a memorable moment. But, you know, talk about synchronicity, Coach. I mean, to, to be so inspired by somebody like Rocky and then go on. I, you know, I didn't go into the NFL. I didn't win any Super Bowls, anything like that. But the fact that I could actually run again <laughs> and not be a victim was huge. To put it in your words, I'm possible. <laughs> wow. That was certainly a portrayal of how you got into character to be able to move yourself forward and find the power within you, inspired by events that other people had had happen to them, but you you saw how it might relate to you, and that just was like flint on a rock. It just set you on fire, and you took off. Tell me now uh, what a powerful uh, testimony that was. Thank you so much uh, for that. I'm, I'm very appreciative of some of the directions that you've taken lately, uh, because there's an intersection that I haven't seen which is how higher higher thought how even to to stretch the word, to use the word spirituality and business in the same sentence is almost offensive to some people uh oozy woozy to other people airy fairy to some and yet thousands of years have gone by where business and spirituality have coexisted because Whatever we're doing, we are one. We are whole. We are here. Um, tell us how you got this idea and where you think um, that can be applied to today in, in uh, American businesses. Yeah, well, uh, that's a great question, Coach. So I, a lot of people have asked me, how in the world did you get into writing books like Zentrepreneur, combining Zen practices with entrepreneurship or, or business and miracle-minded manager, books like that? And uh, again, not planned. I was writing uh, leadership development books, team building books, customer service books, business books, basically. And uh, in fact, I was halfway through a book in the year 2000 
uh, when my father became deathly ill and, and, and passed, and I, I stopped writing that book and stopped writing completely for nine years. So from 2000 to 2009, I wasn't writing anything anymore. I just wasn't feeling it. So I was doing my business consulting and, uh, and some speaking engagements, things like that. And uh, and lots of research. And because of my father's illness, I really got into a lot of research on, on holistic health, alternative health, you know, prevention, nutrition, uh, mindfulness exercises, meditations, things like that. And one of the things I kept coming across was uh, references to A Course in Miracles. Deepak Chopra, you mentioned uh, Deepak. Uh, References, of course, in miracles. Dr. David Hawkins at the time was very influential on me, referencing a course in miracles. Uh, and so I was just curious, what what is this course in miracles all about? Wayne Dyer, he'd reference it. And uh, one day I came home from a, a a road trip, and I had a stack of mail, and I'm going through this pile of mail, and there's an invitation to take a course in miracles on my desk. <laughs> well, there, there's a that, that's interesting. That's so miraculous. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I I looked into it, signed up, and it's a 365 day course. It's one lesson a day for a, a year, and it's basically a channeling that Helen Shookman did. She was a psychiatrist at Columbia University back in the 70s, and she started hearing a voice, a channeling, uh, and it's believed to be she was channeling the voice of Jesus. And so the instructions and the lessons and the mantras, the 365-day course, is it's like mind-blowing. It's powerful. So I, I, I took it. And while I was taking this, which was like 2008, 2009, I was over in France teaching a, a week-long event, followed by a week-long event up in England. So I had the weekend in between. And I, again, I hadn't written in nine years. And I got up on a Saturday morning. I was just going to go get some coffee and look at cathedrals and wander around outside of Lyon, France. But there was a presence, I'll just call it, very commanding presence in my room telling me it was time to start writing again. I'm wondering if it's my dad. I don't know, you know, it's, but it's, you're going to start writing again. And I was resistant, uh, Coach. I was like, no, I'm not. I, I don't know what to write about. I don't have time right now to write. I'm super busy. It's, I had all these excuses, so I'm resisting. But long story short, it wouldn't go away. I finally opened my laptop and I said, you want me to write? Uh, tell me what to write. And I start channeling what became a 2010 Best Inspirational Book of the Year in Canada by a, a, a big critic called All Books Review. And it was called, the book was called Beyond Doubt, Four Steps to Inner Peace. So this book was all about inner peace, essentially, and, and mindfulness. And I didn't know where it was coming from, but I was just, I was writing it. And when it was published, it would be in the spiritual section of the bookstore, not the business section. But a couple of years later, I'm up working in Toronto for a big company up there. And, and uh, I was essentially living there for about a year and a half. And uh, the company was looking to, I'm a contracted consultant. They're looking for an internal person to replace me, to train under me and then replace me. And they didn't have anybody internal that they thought was ready. So they were going to hire for the position. And they asked me to help them with that. Long story short, we find this guy from Toyota. Toyota's uh, a, a great company in terms of doing what I teach, operational excellence and Lean Six Sigma and flow and things like that. And he's a sensei, a master teacher at Toyota of Canada. Dr. Jake Abraham is his name. And uh, they asked me to, to do one of the final interviews with him. He'd passed all the preliminary interviews. So I go in and uh, to the director's office, and Jake is there. I'd never met him before, and the director is there. And the director introduces me as John Murphy, and Jake looks right at me, and he goes, "Beyond doubt, John Murphy." And I said, "Yeah. How do you know about Beyond Doubt?" He said, "We're using it at Toyota to teach our senseis." 
I almost fell over. Here, here's a book I didn't think was a business book or a leadership book. And he said, no, we're teaching uh, inner peace to, you know, and mindfulness oh, to our, God. our senses. So there you go. This book. You're blessed. Never, You're yeah. blessed, John. But, but, but that's a uh, coach. That's, that's the progression and the evolution of my career. It's like I said, I, I didn't plan to write this book. I didn't even know what I was writing at the time. By the way, the book was also uh, for me because I was about to go through one of the worst times of my life. And uh, so it was teaching me a model to use to maintain inner peace going through a really rough time. And so uh, I didn't know that at the time. But later on, I really appreciated it. Incidentally, when I got back to the States after being in Europe for a couple of weeks, uh, this was in 2008, 2009, during a deep recession, as you might recall. Uh, all, my contract work basically all got frozen. And so I went from being super busy to not having anything to do. So I remember sitting at my desk one day and just looking up going, all right, I'll finish the book. <laughs> Because that was one of my excuses. I don't have time for this right now. I'm too busy. All right. And as soon as I finished the book and submitted it, uh, my work started picking back up again. So I don't know what you want to call that, but I, I, I think uh, you use the word blessings. I think it was a blessing. Wow. But then that first book, Beyond Doubt: The Four Steps to Inner Peace. That's what, that's what got me combining, a lot of spiritual research and teachings, with, with business. And I, I love the work of uh, like Deepak Chopra, who combines his medical training and knowledge with spirituality. And a Greg Braden who combines science. Greg's a scientist with with spirituality. Uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, you know, his biology of belief. I, I was fascinated by how some of these folks are combining two different genres, if you will call it that, into an integrated teaching. Why can't I do that with spiritual, spirituality and business and entrepreneurship? So Beyond Doubt led to a book I wrote called Sage Leadership, combining a lot of sage teachings with leadership. And then I wrote Zentrepreneur, combining Zen practices with you know peace of mind with, with action. And then my latest book, Miracle Minded Manager, combines A Course in Miracles with, and it's an allegory, so it's a story about how a guy who's stressing out. Actually, it's a sequel, uh, another sequel to Agent of Change, which I wrote 26 years ago. The same characters. And he's he said to this consultant who helped him change the corporate culture, he said, you know, help me change the culture here. And that's been awesome. Can you help me change me? Because I'm I'm stressing and I've got. You know, I've got problems. So you go through the story, uh, learning about how to apply peace of mind, which is really what the course is all about, and forgiveness uh, with, with everyday life, family, uh, work challenges, physical, emotional, uh, mental challenges, any challenges you have, how do you adopt this model uh, taught in the Course in Miracles into your life? and and that book was an award-winning book too. So that, um, in fact, it's being featured in New Orleans uh, later this month at, at a huge book event. Congratulations! I'm excited that about too. that. Yes, sir. It's uh, you know, it's become fashionable almost, John, for us to hear the word mindfulness um, these days. I've had, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have a former commander of the Navy SEALs and a former another guest, a former fighter pilot, both of those people are now teaching mindfulness. Uh, and and that they're teaching it to businesses, corporations, and to individuals, like you just said, because uh, if there's no me, there's no we. So first of all, and I can just talk about my own personal business and how I got closer to Deepak Chopra more than 12 years ago, because I reached a point in my life where although business was going everywhere is fine, I still found myself emotionally bankrupt. And so I wasn't connecting. I wasn't connecting uh, with my life. Somehow I felt empty, even though on the surface, everything looked great. 
And so I, you know, was, I went out there and I found that there were 300 other people who were, you know, CEOs or scientists or teachers. And we were all there learning a meditation practice that, you know, Deepak created. And we heard that story and we got grounded and recentered. And it's books, authors like that and, and programs that you create that are going to really help change the world to a, a more positive spin. Because I think we, we kind of got lost in the whole race of materialism. And we think that just getting over on somebody and letting us win and them lose is a good thing. And then we have t-shirts that say karma, but <laughs> nobody's taking any responsibility for it. So I think that, that the, the things that you're doing right now are just wonderful. I congratulate you on the award-winning recognition that you're getting well-deserved. So John Murphy, what a great privilege it has been to meet you at the first time. Like I said, please expect we will be inviting you uh, back onto the show, find out more about some of the uh, juxtapositions of business and spirituality. We, we know it, it makes a lot of sense. And from a sensei like yourself, we would really be honored if you would come back again. Oh, I'd love to come back, Coach. You betcha. It's, uh, I'm all about uh, helping people in any way I can. I believe that's our real purpose in life, to use the gifts we've been given, whatever those might be, to give away. That's how I describe someone's personal mission statement, to use the gifts you've been given to give away, make the new world a better place. So, um, and I've helped people write personal mission statements. One of my favorite examples is Walt Disney. So uh, Walt Disney had a personal mission statement. It was to use my imagination to bring happiness to millions. So he had a great way of phrasing his gift of imagination for a purpose, bringing happiness to millions, which is also a vision statement. Happiness to millions is a vision he had. So it's a beautiful illustration of combining mission and purpose with vision. You know, what What do I see in the future uh, that I can help manifest? And uh, for me, it's 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 very it's very much the same way. Using my imagination and creativity uh, to 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 help millions of people uh, improve their lives. Uh, John, can I just ask you as a parting gift? Because we talked about gifts, or you did. Uh, what could you wish for our audience as we go forward in 2023? What can they do? How can they? What what kind of affirmation or thought process could they go through to help them center and balance and and find their own calling? Yeah, I think the most important thing, Coach, is that we're mindful about our feelings. How are we feeling? And what vibe, what energy are we putting out from our hearts? Because that vibe attracts like vibes. And I love the work of Dr. David, the late David Hawkins uh, in the Map of Consciousness, where he's actually using a, a, a science called uh, applied kinesiology to calibrate the, the vibration, if you're the energy frequency value of every feeling from shame and guilt at the low end of the model, up through fear and anxiety and doubt, up through uh, lust and anger and pride. And at pride, you kick out of the ego category, so to speak, the human nature category through courage. And it's that courage vibe that I call it the bridge that takes you into an unconditional love uh, vibe where you're in the vibe of appreciation and gratitude and forgiveness and freedom. And you just you, you feel fantastic. What's important there is that the vibe we're putting out day to day is what's attracting is what's coming back to us. It's, it's karmic, so to speak. So pay attention. Be mindful of the vibe you're putting out. Misery loves company. We've all heard that. So change the frequency. It's like changing the dial on a radio. Each channel has a frequency. Well, we do too. And so if you're in a, a, a doom and gloom, anxious, worried vibe, you need to re recognize that you can change that. And you change that by what you think. 
Because if you're worried and you're stressed, what you're thinking is you're you're not present, number one. You're thinking about something going wrong in the future. Something's going to go wrong, and that's what I'm anxious about. And your body responds. Your heart rate goes up, your cortisol, your, your, your adrenaline, your stress hormones all kick in. And you feel that it's real, and it's all in your mind. So mindful leadership is about minding your mind. And, and, and every problem is a solution in disguise. There's, there's two sides of the same coin. So what are you looking at, the problem or the solution? And what you're looking at makes all the difference. Great leaders, mindful leaders, see problems as opportunities. We're, we're gonna, we got this. We're going to solve this. But if it's all doom and gloom, you're in a bad frequency. And uh, I don't, be careful. <laughs> Right, because be careful where you put your quarters and what jukebox. So if you're thinking, if our if you're already anxious, you're going to get top of the pops of the worst case scenarios playing day in and day out. And if you change your frequency and begin to attract the possibilities, the possibilities will come play in your backyard. That's right. Light up the room. There's light within you. Let it let it shine. Thank you so much for being. A great example of Mission I'm Possible today. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, John. Thank you, Coach.